What's up, you beautiful bastards? Hope you're having a fantastic Tuesday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show, and let's just jump into it. And the first thing we have to talk about today is if you do not follow me on Twitter, Follow me on Twitter now. And this is unfortunately not just like fun self-promotion. Follow me here, follow me everywhere. This is in direct response to YouTube having been broken the past few weeks. And it's broken in many different respects. Some of you on top of being subscribed have notifications turned on. Sometimes you don't get that for several hours, sometimes several days. That's always fun. Sometimes the notifications go out, but then for one to two hours, the video doesn't show up in subscription feeds as well as the videos page on YouTube. And so the only way to find the video is by clicking on the notification to get there directly or going to Twitter. The moment I make the video go live, I tweet it out. Make sure you get notifications for me there. I don't really post much more stupid shit. YouTube says they're looking into it, so maybe today there were no problems because someone was actually paying attention, but I, I have very, I, I hate saying this. I have very little faith in there being a long-term solution for this, so just if you wanna make sure you get the show when it's out and it's not just not invisible for one to two hours, make sure you follow us on Twitter. But yeah, that's the end of this first story. And then I wanna talk about two separate stories that involve newly released video. And the first of these stories comes from April of 2014. Sial Angelau was on trial for racketeering and robbery. He was allegedly a member of the Tongan Crips, which is a gang with members in California and Utah, as well as a few other places. There was a witness that took the stand who was reportedly testifying about life in the Tongan Crip gang. The witness was Viola Tanifa, a former member of the Tongan Crips. He was testifying for the state while serving up to 30 years in prison. And during the testimony, reportedly Angelau took a pen from his attorney and rushed the witness stand, and that resulted in a U.S. Marshal firing four shots into Angelau, which led to his death. Now, in June of 2014, an FBI investigation into the death said that the Marshal's actions were justified. But in 2016, Angelau's family filed a wrongful death lawsuit alleging that the Marshal used excessive force and was negligent when she fired her weapon. The lawsuit also saying, there is nothing more excessive, reckless, and conscience shocking than a federal Marshal standing over an individual and shooting him as he lies face down on a courtroom floor. And so because of this case, local news outlets filed a motion to intervene to ask the judge to order the release of the video of the shooting. The government initially objected to the video's release, alleging that the video would give away security measures in the courtroom. But last week, the judge ruled that the surveillance video of the shooting would be released, and that happened yesterday. The actual shooting is blacked out, but here it is. Walls. He casually got up, got the pen, and then jumped at the witness trying to stab them. It looks like at all moments, Angelau is a threat, and for anyone to call stopping that person excessive force, that is pure insanity. He literally tried to murder a witness in the courtroom. So there was that. And the second story I want to talk about here involves bail agent Chastity Dawn Carey. Chastity was facing first degree murder charges because she shot one of her clients dead. During the trial, she said she and her 19 year old son were trying to take this client back into custody. He was free on bail at the time, and reportedly he didn't want to be handcuffed. And Carrie told the jury, I was afraid he was going to shoot my son. I felt like we were going to be killed. I've never been that scared before. Carrie testifying that the man that she killed, Brandon James William, he attempted to grab her gun before fleeing out of her office window. She said she beat Williams to the gun and turned to fire just as he was going out the window. And so she shot Williams in the back. And so that's why prosecutors said that she was not acting in self-defense. She shot this guy in the back after he was no longer a threat. But this past Friday, the jury did not agree with the prosecution and found Chastity not guilty. Now, like I said, though, this story is about a video, a video that was released by the DA yesterday, a video that was reported shown in court, but it has raised a lot of questions. In the video, we see Chastity deadbolt the door. Williams realize what's happening. He is obviously not happy. He does not want to be handcuffed. Put your hands behind your back. Don't! Put your hands on me! And all of that leads to this moment. What are you doing this to me for? Why are you doing this? Hands behind your What are you doing this to me for, man? I did. The son then seems to remember that he left the GoPro up and then he pulls it down, turns it off. And as many people have pointed out after watching this video, at no point does it look like he knows that there's a gun or he's grabbing for it. It looks like Chastity pushes him to that part of the room. The next thing we see in the corner, a curtain fling up. So based off the information we have, it looks like at that point he's trying to get out the window. We see Chastity seemingly unopposed go to the drawer with the gun and then fire at Williams, hitting him in the back. And I will say personally, I don't get how this was not murder. I mean, one, look at the size of that guy. At any point, if this guy wanted to be violent, he could have been violent against Chastity or her son. Easily. Yes, he is not complying with a bail agent, but he's not being violent. He's not being the aggressor. In fact, he gets pushed in such a way he actually ends up being closer to the gun, which I don't even know if he knows about. Because once again, Chastity said that he tried to grab the gun. One, he was closer. 
Two, he could have obviously overpowered her if they, were, they, they both made a mad scramble. But then three, it just looks like he just tried to get away, which seems to be confirmed since he was shot in the back as he was going out of a window. Personally, it just seems batshit crazy to me, but I, I will pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts now seeing that footage? But from that, I wanna share some stuff I love today. And today in Awesome, brought to you by ShopDeFranco.com. ShopDeFranco, of course, the place to get fantastic gear that also supports this show. We can snag new bestsellers like the Stay Humble, Hustle Hard shirt and or hoodie. Why be informed when you can use your feelings as your fact shirt, classics like the pretentious box logo, sports, don't be stupid, stupid, and much more. So if you want to snag one while you can, go to shopdefranco.com or just click the link in the description down below. And the first bit of awesome is we got the teaser trailer for the new Fantastic Beasts movie. We had Life Noggin asking, should we live on Venus before Mars? We had News Story putting out this really interesting video about 3D printed homes for the developing world. And if you want to see the full versions of everything I just shared, the secret link of the day, anything at all, links as always are in the description down below. And then let's talk about yet another big Trump administration shakeup. This morning, Donald Trump tweeting, Mike Pompeo, director of the CIA, will become our new secretary of state. He will do a fantastic job. Thank you to Rex Tillerson for his service. Gina Haspel will become the new director of the CIA and the first woman so chosen. Congratulations to all. What a weird and or trolly way to end a tweet. Two people got promotions and one person was fired. Congratulations, everyone. But yeah, just like that, Rex Tillerson out of a job. After just a little over a year on the job, he's out. But if you're really paying attention, it's not the most surprising thing. Tillerson and Trump had disagreements. The Iran deal comes to mind. Yeah, Trump calling it a catastrophe, an embarrassment. Tillerson thought less so. Reports saying that Tillerson wanted Trump to stick with the Iran deal, but make some changes. They also disagreed on policy regarding Russia, the Paris Climate Accord, North Korea, just to name a few things. When asked about Trump comments in the past, Tillerson, of course, said the president just speaks for himself. We also saw some people today trying to point to Trump and Tillerson's comments about the Russian spy story out of the UK we talked about the other day. Tillerson saying that the poisoning of an ex-Russian spy in Britain clearly came from Russia. But also, if we look at video footage, it looks like Trump kinda sorta agrees, but maybe in less strong words. It sounds to me like it would be Russia based on all of the evidence they have. I don't know if they've come to a conclusion, but she's calling me today. It sounds to me like they believe it was Russia, and I would certainly take that finding as fact. Yeah, as soon as we get the facts straight, and we're gonna be speaking with the British today, we're speaking with Theresa May today, and as soon as we get the facts straight, if we agree with them, we will condemn Russia or whoever it may be. So it sounds to me like it's Russia. I take their finding as fact, but as soon as we get facts straight, if we agree with them, I guess in addition to me saying I agree with them, then we will condemn Russia or maybe someone else if it was someone else. Now, was that just the final straw between Tillerson and Trump? I don't know. A lot of experts have been pointing that this probably has more to do with North Korea than Russia. According to reports, a senior White House official has said that Trump wanted to replace Tillerson so he could have a new team in place for the upcoming talks with Kim Jong-un. But even that gets a little bit muddy because this morning the president said it was for multiple reasons. Saying he and Tillerson were not thinking the same. Trump saying he and Pompeo were always on the same wavelength. Also, as far as the firing itself, there are conflicting reports about when Tillerson found out. Some saying that he knew this decision was gonna come down Friday and others saying that Tillerson found out through Trump's tweet this morning. For example, the New York Times said that Tillerson had been fired Friday, but has since updated their story to read. Mr. Tillerson learned he had been fired on Tuesday morning when a top aide showed him a tweet from Mr. Trump announcing the change, according to a senior State Department official. But he had gotten an oblique warning of what was coming the previous Friday from the White House Chief of Staff, John Kelly, who called to tell him to cut short a trip to Africa and advised him, you may get a tweet. We also have now an update to this part of the story. Reportedly, the State Department employee that said Tillerson found out via Twitter that he was fired has now been fired. That now fired employee also telling reporters that Tillerson was unaware of the reason he was fired. And two White House officials reportedly told the Associated Press that he was fired for saying these things. And so the next step in all of this is that Haspel and Pompeo will need to be confirmed by the Senate. And that might not go smoothly, at least just for Haspel. This because of some of the stuff in her history. Reportedly in 2002, Haspel oversaw the brutal torture of two terrorism suspects in a secret prison in Thailand. She also later reportedly took part in an order to destroy videotapes documenting their interrogations as well. I mean, it really wouldn't be too shocking for there to be pushback. Back in 2013, Democratic Senator Dianne Feinstein actually blocked a promotion for Haspel. And back in 2017, multiple Senate Democrats asked Trump to withdraw Haspel from consideration for her role as deputy director of the CIA. She still obviously went into that position, but the big note there is that that did not require Senate approval, so we're dealing with a new situation. But ultimately, we'll just have to wait and see what happens. And then let's talk about the combination of two things that you, you probably wouldn't think would mix. One, the complexities around the gun debate in America, and Jake Paul. Yesterday, Jake Paul posted a video to his channel titled, It's Time to End School Shootings. And in it, he talks to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School students, their families, elected officials, such as Broward County Commissioner Michael Udine, also Florida Senator Marco Rubio. And by the end of the video, he shares what he learned and lists five things that he thinks need to be changed. One, install bulletproof windows. Every, every family that I talked to talked about having bulletproof windows inside uh, 
on the doors, it could have saved five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten lives. Two, have more school resource officers. Having more school resource officers allows more ears throughout the school. Three, make social media companies do more. Like I know on Instagram, if, if a girl posts a picture with her nipples out, like it automatically gets flagged and removed from Instagram and like reported under a system. So why can't we have that same technology with a kid taking a selfie with, with a handgun? Or provide students with defensive gear. There are like these bulletproof shields that can fit into laptop pouches of backpacks. If I was a student again, back in 2012, and I knew this information, I wouldn't have gone to school another day without one of those in my backpack. And five, have checkpoints at school entries. If there was a check-in point, then this kid would have had to go, go by the check-in point. He would have had to have his ID. He would have had to have had a reason for being there. He also promises to spend $25,000 to be a part of the cause, adding that part of it would be used to transport two buses of people to the March for Our Lives in Washington scheduled for March 24th. Now, the reason this became a big story is that outside of his fan base, this video faced a lot of criticism. There were people arguing about each of his points, but to be fair to Jake Paul, the ideas that I mentioned here are not far off from suggestions we've heard from other students, parents throughout the country. But also on top of that, one of the biggest pieces that people were critical about is that at no point does he mention gun control. But to that, I would say, while it wasn't really hit on in the video, in the description, he does mention gun reform briefly. And after getting hammered on this point, he then went to Twitter to write, real gun reform is absolutely the most significant part of the overall conversation. However, I wanted to simplify some of the steps we discussed with Parkland students and add some different elements to the conversation. Make no mistake, gun reform is an absolute must, but is part of the solution. Then captioning that post with five more recommendations, saying, gun reform changes we need, in my opinion. Be at least 21 to buy a gun, go through a six month minimum course similar to a driver's license course, professional mental heath evaluation, ban gun shows now, 30 day wait period after purchase to receive firearms. You also had people in places like Polygon saying that Jake Paul might not be the best mouthpiece for this. This because what Jake Paul is touting as his personal views right now are undercut by other content that he's put out in the past. In moments like this from a video from mid last year. We have 20 pounds of explosives. We have <laughs> machine guns. He and his friend showing off gun thigh tattoos. There's a montage of people posing with guns, close ups of guns and ammo. In the video, there's this interaction between Jake Paul and Nick Crompton. I don't know if I trust you. Neither do I, because like I do want to just shoot people right Justin. now. But all of that takes us to the end of the story as far as people asking me what my opinion is. I can't believe you're making me do this. I kind of have to defend Jake Paul. I'm not happy about it either. Could Jake Paul be one of the most manipulative, self-serving bastards on the planet? Whether it be this situation, other past situations, like after, after the hurricane and flooding in Texas when he and his friends went down there with, with jet skis and they helped people, but they filmed the entire thing. But then it becomes this argument and debate about intent and impact. Impact, right, that's the conversation of did Jake Paul do that and now this to make himself look good or because he actually wanted to help people raise awareness, promote change. But you could also have that same argument about any celebrity that donates to charity ever, right? Whether it be people like Kevin Hart and, and The Rock challenging each other to, to donate for this good cause or Drake donating the entire $1 million budget for God's plan to schools, right? It'd be on a different scale, but you could have the debate of intent versus impact. Two, I also think that, that someone previously handling weapons or being enthusiastic about shooting it shouldn't negate their opinion in the future regarding guns. Like there's a video from 2012 of me shooting an AR-15. Granted, in the beginning of the video, uh, I'm very much of the mindset of uh, why would I ever fucking need this weapon? When would you use all of this? But then also in that same video, very much enjoying shooting some Tanner. Because that exists, that shouldn't negate someone's opinion about the gun situation in this country in the future. That said, I am a little bit skeptical around Jake Paul considering how he really just glossed over, bypassed other than a, a text piece talking about gun reform, but then seemingly after being called out about it, he then had all these other ideas. I don't know, I wanna pass the question off to you. Do you think that the media and people are being far too negative against Jake Paul because he is who he is? Do you think he's a good mouthpiece for, for this conversation, especially considering his audience? I'd love to know your thoughts because I, I know that when this story was recommended, I, I thought that I was gonna be far more negative, but instead I find myself more skeptical and, and critical of certain points he made, but, but mainly skeptical. And I think ultimately where I land is actually the, the, the closing of a New Statesman article on Jake Paul. It says, Jake Paul may not be a good person. It might even be a stretch to describe the video as good, but the YouTuber made an effort that should be commended, not mocked. Jake Paul has a young audience, an audience that even people like myself don't hit at the level that he hits. And while I think there is a valid reason to question his intent, the impact, the net result of what he did is sharing the story from survivors of this shooting 
with his audience. But like I said, that's my personal takeaway and I would love to know your thoughts. And that's where I'm going to end today's show. And remember, if you like this video, like what I'm trying to do on this channel, hit that like button. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button. Also, if you didn't see yesterday's Philip DeFranco show, you wanna catch up, click or tap right there to watch that. Or if you need something lighter, we have the newest behind the scenes vlog, click or tap right there to watch that. But that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow.